Oh man, my timing was off, but here we are. I was going to say, man, you're a little bit rusty. We go, we don't cast for a few for a few days, and all of a sudden you're you're ripping the cord on the on the intro song. That everybody loves so much. But, <laughs> I feel oh. really good, but I'm a little bit slow right now. That's, That's all right. slower you're than usual. Mode, man, you're not you're not quite crisp yet. You're glad to taking us a tee off. It's August 29th, the year 2023. Welcome, boy, everybody. You're listening to the Crushing Iron Podcast, episode 700. And nine. Here it is. Like it or not, yeah, coming at like, you. Don't yeah. Don't tell me you're getting like stale and rusty already. You're only like what one day in the taper mode for Wisconsin next week. You can't. <laughs> you can't be. You can't be that far off your game already. Because if you are, then we need to. We need to ramp things up for another few days. Make sure you stay crisp. Oh, I'm gonna ready. be ramping. Put some tension in, you know. Or you could just you know do like a 95 week taper like a lot of people do and just be stale as a stale as a Triscuit. No, as seven. we talked. As we talked, I don't think I deserve two weeks. <laughs> I mean, listen, <laughs> most yeah, what I've what I've found in in the years I've done this is there's 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 rarely ever a third bucket. There's the one bucket where you know you probably overtrained yourself to death, so you feel like you need a three week tape, and then you go into the race and you're just shot. And you got you know athletes that yeah, maybe don't need a full two weeks, like they maybe need a one week tape. I just had this conversation this morning with an athlete who was who did Tremblant. She was like, I've never felt so great. The taper was perfect. Maybe, you know, maybe a one week taper is good for me. And I'm like, yeah, it looks like it was. And then you got, you know, then the other, the other, you know, piece or the third, the third bucket is the ones who train consistently and they nail things. Don't do too much. Don't do too little. And then, you know, it's like a, you know, 10 to to 14 day taper. Uh, But yeah, it's always, it's always interesting to see like, the different taper scenarios and and things that people do in their last big weekend and and then how like much they unload and see it's it's always interesting but there's always a good ways to go and the taper i've always found that you know the taper is a lot like long course racing some days you're going to feel like your legs are about to just you know you could rip the pedals off and you could you know go do a sprint race with you know peter sagan and then the other couple days you're like i don't even know if i'm going to start (laughs) <laughs> I might just, I might DNS. Like I feel terrible. I mean, my body's run down. I'm getting got niggles in places, you know, the backside of my thumb. It's like got this weird pain. I don't really know what's going on. You know, so you just kind of go through like all these different like emotional roller coasters, you know, in the meantime, you're like, what's the water temp? What's the real elevation gain on the second and a half loop? You know, not the third point. And then you people asking like all these questions the last week and I'm like, if you didn't know this four or five months out, then God help you because you you're behind the eight ball. I and mean, the other part is it really doesn't matter. You know, what if I'm going to tell you the elevation gain is 3000 feet more? Is it going to change at your fitness? Nope. Doesn't make you worry more. Close mm-hmm. your ears, get off Facebook, tune, tune into, you know, Netflix and chill college footballs this weekend. Could you have had a better weekend leading up to a race? You get Monday off work. It's labor day. Settle in folks. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy the weekend. We hope you enjoy today's podcast. If it's your first time tuning in, welcome. We appreciate you giving us your time. We know you have quite a lot of options in the triathlon podcast universe and just podcasts in general. Trying to be valuable. We appreciate you tuning in today. We cover all. We do swim, bike, and run specific podcasts. We do race recaps and also a a lot of race previews. But for the most part, Mike and I as coaches, athletes, best friends, we just sit back, relax, have an open, honest discussion about what we're going through in life, not just as human beings, but also as coaches and athletes ourselves. Uh, we also talk frequently about what our own athletes are going through. Mike and I work with a wide range of athletes all across the globe from beginner level athletes looking at their very first 5K or sprint triathlon all the way up through elite level amateurs trying to get back to world championships and everyone in between from all over the globe. And we use the feedback loop we have with them and training peaks, emails, text messages, and the like to drive the discussion of the day. We also utilize our Facebook group, like we did last Thursday, and we'll look in today. Uh, it's a great group, great community. You can get on Facebook and search that Crushing Iron group. Answer that one simple question. We'll let you right in. Awesome people come, uh, and a lot of great, just honestly, a lot of great information in there uh, and a lot of good feedback. If you got questions, ask them. Don't be a lurker. Be a participant, and we'll go in there uh, once a month and do a little bit of a Q&A, and uh, depending on how many questions we get, we'll do try to knock it out in one episode, but – we had a lot this last time, so it'll be a little bit of a two-parter. Uh, and that's it. We don't do sponsors. We don't do ads. But we do have an agenda. And that's to keep you happy and healthy in your endurance sports journey. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you know, I had a four-hour ride on uh, Saturday. And you know me. I don't have – I don't – I just don't ride with power. I'm sorry. 
You know, it's a long ride for you. I know <laughs> it was a long ride, and I just turned my watch on. I basically just kind of do that for posterity and to maybe look at my heart rate a little bit later and see whatever. But it is a little discouraging to get off the bike and and see you averaged point uh, four miles an hour for four hours <laughs> and and. <laughs> And went 1.58 miles. <laughs> that was like well, probably trainer, sliding back and forth into arrow <laughs> for mileage. Well, you know, trainer miles are really important to people for some reason, even though you're legit not going anywhere. I you're know. Pedaling on the road it's fast to nowhere. It's all mental uh, toughness for me, man. That's all it is. It is. It's, it is definitely that. Before we get into the uh, questions from the uh, Facebook group, quick question since sure. we're about to be on the we're on the precipice of the college football season what's your what's your prediction for the wisconsin badgers this year mm. and I, what and and by what week will you proclaim you're done i think after we, well, after we be, football and you're done with cable so give, give me give me both <laughs> of those yeah well <laughs> I'll start with when I'm done. It was after we beat Ohio State, and then we like lose the next week or something like that. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I boy, I think we, I think we might Real be ten and two. Over. Ooh, okay. So you're one that you're one the under. And yeah. I did notice that in the preseason ESPN poll of most likely college football matchups for the bowl season. 82% had Wisconsin Badgers versus Tennessee. Tennessee Volunteers. It seems like they always kind of play that card. They do. Yeah, they do. I think the Outback Bowl. Sort uh, of like the maybe Citrus or Outback Bowl. Third or fourth, fourth bowl. best team in the conference kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm 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 two to three losses for us this year. I think we'll have a good year. I think Joe Milton's gonna play well. Uh and if not, I get a lot of confidence in our I back. See be people good. talking about Heisman for that guy. I mean, listen, athletically. And this is true with all sports. As a physical specimen, he has the biggest arm in college football, the biggest rocket. But playing the quarterback position above any position in football is all about the chin up. Decision making, how quick can you make decisions, being smart, being patient, moving in the pocket. That's always been his big, and that's why he's recruited to Michigan in the first hand, you know, in the first place. Um so we'll see. I got I got I got some faith in him. They said he's grown a lot. It's been a little, you know, it's his time behind hooker the last you know year or two years so i got i got i've got high hopes for him this year uh, defense <laughs> so we'll see i can yeah, just see him in the it. pocket waving that left arm deeper just keep going <laughs> just keep going <laughs> yeah, just like playing like intramural flag football You're like go baby go yeah. just send it just, just drawing plays in the sand and shit yeah just go just out here and go here. long <laughs> <laughs> here, we're going you know, to overthrow everybody, overthrow everybody, yeah. uh, either, either a completion or an overthrow. But yeah, hey, she I, should, should be good. I was just going to say, I I, uh, I started watching that Swamp thing last night. You probably aren't going to watch that, are you? No, I'll watch it. I mean, it's about the, I mean, isn't it about the total like Bush League approach of Urban Meyer and how he took like convicted felons and let them get away with murder for three or four years? Uh, well, they, they handle that pretty interestingly. You'll have to see it, oh, but uh, okay. he had, I mean, he had a, I thought a very interesting point about that. Um, about the, about the Aaron Hernandez aspect. Well, he didn't talk about that one. <laughs> oh, that's, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm alluding to. Uh, but he talked about players and how, you know, sometimes they come from places and it's tough place and how, you know, sometimes you, you, you know, little mistakes, little mistakes, of course, uh, can be the end of their you know, they have no direction at, you know, other than football. Yeah. So, you know, he, he just talked about that, and I thought it was interesting. But he also said one thing I thought was really kind of funny. He's like, because I thought it related to racing a little bit. He said uh, after the, he won his first uh, national title there, you know, he said he called his dad. He said, we did it, and there's now I the pressure's off my back. I got no more pressure. I'm going to have fun doing this the rest of my life. And then there was a long pause, and he said, it didn't take me long to realize it was probably the most incorrect thing a human being has ever said. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. So I just thought that was so applicable maybe to like somebody doing their first Ironman and thinking, ah, oh, now it's just going to be fun. And yeah, games. now it's gonna be, I'm not going to take it serious. I checked it off the box. You know, it's like, what, I swear we'll get into the questions, but it's like a similar comment I made to an, to a, uh, an athlete yesterday in training peaks. I said, listen, I said, I said, life is, you know, how we deal with life is a lot like, you know, 
how you should try to react as a coach. You know, most coaches will always tell you they spend a lot more time focusing on the losses than they do the wins. That's what keeps them up at night, right? Mm-hmm. The losses, not the championships, but you know, the the two point loss or the last second field goal that took them out of the championship game before they made the Super Bowl or the national championship, whatever it was. That's the ones that they stick with. But I was like, and but so what I try to do in life, it, to my best of my ability, I'm not I'm not perfect at it, is to focus on the wins, not the losses. Um, because that you know, the focusing on the losses and can I mean, hell, life's not hard. Or excuse me, life isn't life's not easy. Uh, so it you know if you focus on just the losses, then a lot of times you know that's why the wins don't mean much because you don't focus on them. So uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, but I can I can relate to that. Um, and it's good to see Urban Meyer said something funny and something that anyone could take and you know with a grain of salt and apply <laughs> their life. Well, I mean that's just kind of the story in my training life. I, I I'm a big win focuser. And I, <laughs> you are a big win focuser, right? Yeah, I mean, I try to be like sort of a beacon of hope sometimes for people who maybe haven't done whatever they think they wanted to do or whatever, and just try to, you know, I talk to a lot of athletes in this situation their last few weeks or the last month, and like you said, there's nothing you can do to change the course or anything like that. So you've got all you have is the time left to try to hone in, you know, strategies and mental approaches and toughness and confidence and that's all you got man so i don't i don't sit around and think about that day a few weeks ago when i couldn't run more than four miles because of the heat or whatever two weeks that's not in my uh game plan right now and you're you are you're like the ambassador to the undertrained (laughs) yeah i am so yeah hashtag undertrained hashtag ambassador uh, <laughs> you, know, tw- you, get, you get a 20 percent discount on your next under, yeah, undertrained uh, training plan um <laughs> before we get too off on a tangent we'll hop in the questions matt kolb it's funny it's funny this is the question because i actually had to answer this last night for a uh, another dad at the that hayden's baseball game He's uh, or the, the question is, can the angle of the seat cause tightness in the hips during the run? I recently raised the nose of my seat up to a more level position and feel that my hips are now more tight when um, when they when I start to run off the bike. One hundred percent. And I t- actually had this conversation last night, a guy that I've seen out like running and walking and like trying to get back in shape. I've seen him out riding my bike in the mornings. I said, you still out there, you know, making your laps and. He said, yeah, he said, the past couple of days, my hip's been hurting. So I've kind of been, you know, coming off. So I started, I did a few Peloton workouts through the day. And, and I said, well, there's your problem. I said, I guarantee you, your seat height and saddle is just way off. Um, because anytime I have an athlete that has, especially like in the hip flexor, if it's really, really tight and pulls, especially on the run, the first thing I ask is not anything running related. It's, have you, have you messed with your seat? Or are you spending more time in air than normal? And is your seat angle, you know, messed up? Or is your hip angle to go, almost every single time the answer is your hip angle is too closed? So yes, the answer could 100% be um, the seat angle. And again, it could be anything. It could be seat angles too forward, seat angles too back. Your seat angles, your your uh, seat post is too high. I mean, any seat is too low. Anything can be the cause of having like a really closed, acute angle. And that can really, really cause um, issues. You won't notice that much on the bike until maybe you get off and kind of stretch out for a minute. Because if you're, especially if you're an aero, or if you're sitting like way back on the saddle, a lot of times people who hop on a road bike, and then instead of sitting on the nose, their saddle, which really opens up their hips, right, to produce power from your quads, if they hop on a road bike for the first time and their saddle heights maybe just the is uh, maybe the same height, they're a little or it could be even shorter is they'll sit farther back to make it more comfortable because I know the saddle is like, you know, jabbing you where it hurts. And so the farther you back you sit, the more closed your hip angle is. And they'll notice some tightness in the hips. And again, it'll show up on the run. So yes, if you ha- if you're having hip flexor issues, again, like honestly, like most issues you see in running, in niggles that pop up, it's almost always um, from the bike. I mean, I had an athlete over the weekend, you know, it's like my calves are really sore. I did raise the seat on my saddle and you're like, you know, that, yeah. Like if you're having, if you're, if your saddle height is too high, then you're obviously having to, um, ex, you know, flex your ankle and your toes down, right. To extend, to reach the pedal, right. Cause you're not getting a full pedal stroke and then to pull it up by really putting that extra pressure on your, on your Achilles and your calves, it might not show up a ton, it might get a little bit tight on the bike. But then as soon as you run, your calves are going to be so tight and so 
flex that you're going to start feeling like, oh, you know, my, my, my calves are about to, and I'm like, no, it's all about the bike fit. Like there is, again, m- most people in their run issues comes from one of two things. One, bike fit. Two, trying to like totally re- adjust your stride or the way your foot strike, you know, all those things or you know, you go to wearing V brooms or you start doing barefoot running, all these things that really are kind of common sense to figure out. Always look at the bike, look at that first before you, you know, troubleshoot anything with your actual running. Um, it's interesting. We, you had this conversation last night because I think we had it on our last podcast. <laughs> or did we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I didn't say anything because I think it is an important point And, uh, I've always had that thing with my hammies and, you know, you talk about your calves and if that's a problem, then it probably stretches up into the hammies and whatever. So I have spent a little time this year kind of tweaking over the summer just because I'm typically a out on the point guy anyway. So, um, yeah, because I've been just uh, really my whole thing is to get more activity in my quads on the bike. Mm -hmm. I think I have a tendency to, um, you know, like you said, lay back on that. But I, I, so I try to be a little more aggressive as you're saying that I was kind of thinking to myself about swimming. Cause you know, I think if you're sitting back on the bike, you're a little more probably relaxed or something, or I don't know what it would be, but I think about in swimming, I kind of lean back. I think a little bit, I should get more out on the point, you know, and get kind of that more of that, that angle, a little more aggressive in my swim. That was just a thought I had during that. And that's why I went over this one again down. from last week. So we, we could always use a little bit of a refresher. Yeah. Uh, next next question. Clay Seal. Clay. How to manage an extreme obstacle during peak Ironman training. Injury, life, both. How do you even begin to navigate, change your goals and your mindset? Call me you know, again, Clay. What's that? I said, call me again, Clay. <laughs> yeah, yeah give, 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 my, give my boy a call. Um, you know, this is this is a great question. And, and I think... Ultimately, um, ultimately, it has to do with it's from the chin up. I mean, it kind of alludes to that, right? It's like you know how to be in the navigate changing your mindset and goals. And I, I don't think you even worry about goals. I think you worry about your mindset. How am I going into the race, right? And and obviously, like you know, injury, life, or both. Like and you know, obstacle. Listen, obstacles have different meanings to everybody, right? Based on life experiences, based on the severity of what it's interfering with, right? You know, like you have an obstacle, getting out the door, getting your kid to baseball. That's a whole different than like having an obstacle where you, you know, you know, break your ankle. (laughs) Like two different obstacles, two different mindsets. Like, again, one is it's the severity in which it affects, you know, your ultimate goal. And the other one is, is, you know, I think the biggest thing is, it's it's easy to get frustrated. It's easy to get resentful. It's easy to get um, re- tank it. If I'm being honest, it's easy to tank it then because you it, it's kind of like someone letting all the air out of your balloon, right? Your, your things are feeling good. I'm ready to go. I'm in peak Ironman training. This is you know this is going well. Then all of a sudden something happens. You get sick. There's a family emergency. You know um, you got a niggle that pops up. You know work goes crazy. All these things all these things pop up. And well, I think the biggest thing you can do is not necessarily give up on your goals, but immediately change your mindset, right? To let me not focus on what I can't do or what I'm going to be unable to do, but let me focus on what I can do, right? So I, you know, you'll see he's running an example because that's usually the one that takes people off their game. You know, I've either got a foot issue or, you know, my hamstrings or my Achilles is like, I lay off running for a little bit or my shoulders are hurting in the swim, whatever it is. It's rarely ever the bike, right? Unless it's like a saddle sore. So let's just say the run for an example is the, is the limiter here. And that's your huge obstacle. Well, then go straight and treat yourself like basically, you know, uh, a professional cyclist, you know, not professional, but, you know, just bike as much as you can find ways to be positive about what you can do, which again is why the sport is so great because you've got, you've always got three options. So if one's taken away, you got two, if two's taken away, you got one, like, you know, you're, even if you're, you know, you're cruising right along and you're in your big block and you got a, a work trip that's popped up and you're gone for a week, you can run. Right, you're not going to lose fitness. You might not gain a ton overall as a triathlete, but you will gain some as a runner, which, coincidentally, is part of being a triathlete. 
So you can always look for things that you can do. And I think what happens oftentimes, and this this goes with race week as well, people always look back, I wish I had more time. I wish I had done more. Look back to the the century rides they didn't do or the brick runs they wish they could have done, that all their friends have done, or the long runs they wish you know, they would have you know finished off. Everybody does like the woulda, coulda, shoulda. And the fact is that you didn't. So why focus on, again, going back to the beginning of the podcast, like, Instead of focusing on the losses, why aren't we focusing on the wins? Because your mindset going into race day, right? And I'll never forget the story that you told me about, you know, going and uh, and sitting at the bar, right? The night before, was it Ironman Chattanooga? Mm-hmm. And you sat next to this guy. Was it that, was it that or the elevator, right? Was, it, was that at the bar? I mean, um, you weren't going down there and get hammered, but wouldn't, like, you set up at the bar for a minute? Could have been, yeah. Yeah, it was. I think it was and, the elevator for some reason, but... And then this guy was like, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and gave you like a laundry list of excuses why he was already going to do bad. Mm. And I'm sure he did, right? So again, the biggest thing you can do, again, whether your training has been perfect or your training has been average or you've had a giant hiccup in it, once you decide to race, you must go all in on racing with a specific mindset. I'm going to do the best I can today. And leave the rest. If you go in the race being all wishy-washy, not sure that you're going to do well, already making excuses, you know, just really obsessing about everything that wasn't done, how unfair it was, and you know, yada yada yada, then yeah, you're going to have a miserable experience. So all you're going to do is fuel fire on that experience. So instead of making a negative even more of a negative, make it a positive, and that starts. That's 100% is a chin up thing. Yeah, I mean, you kind of were talking about a lot about what Clay and I have actually talked about. And, you know, with respect to HIPAA laws and everything, it's an upper body injury of sorts. And uh, he has been doing a lot of running. And, you know, what, like what I say to him is, you know, he's really trained hard and, you know, he's doing Chattanooga and it's about a, what, a month away. And uh, I think he's in a really good spot. And so what he's been doing is because he can't swim and ride right now as he's been running a lot. And like... I think one of my last comments was fitness is fitness. So just keep doing what you're doing. Heal Mm -hmm. up as best you can and then keep your mind right, you know. And he's been running, uh, you know, very well. And uh, we've got time. And it's just now it's just like you said, it's about getting healed up and getting to a place where you're comfortable enough to perform out there. Don't get healed up. Get sealed up. Yeah. Sealed up. Yeah. That joke right there for you. Oh, tomorrow. Get it straight. That's right. Two races coming up. Niagara half Ironman in September and then full Ironman Florida in November and have bicep tendinitis. I'm not able to swim and swim is my weakness. I may be able to in the next few weeks, but not sure of yet. I can sell my half marathon spot or excuse me, half Ironman spot, but I wanted to do that one as a practice swim as I really need it. My big goal is Florida though, and I'm pretty nervous as it is in the water as it always is. Uh, even though I have done four Ironmans, but I do train a lot for my swim so I can do it and feel confident physically, just not always mentally confident and not being able to swim as much as I could like is, all right, I'm going to stop you right there. <laughs> we just answered this question. Mm-hmm. Debbie, we love you. We appreciate you, but we just answered this. You just gave me 98 reasons why you don't need to do it. And one reason why you have to, and that's for your mental confidence. There are a lot of ways you can overcome mental confidence. You can do, and we talked about this last week, you know, or the week before maybe. It was like you can do some visualization. You can, I mean, we talked about this right before we went live today, right? You know, last year, you know, and you talked about it in the podcast, but last year, the day before the race, you got in the water and got, put your wetsuit on and you you had kind of a moment. You did not feel fantastic. Um, yeah. And what have you done in the last few days? Get out in the lake where you're at and where you live now and get in your wetsuit and just just get in it. You know, so I, there are a lot in in no way, shape or form does having an injury and needing to do a full uh, half Ironman just to get in the water make sense. That, frankly, it sounds like an absolutely terrible idea. Like you should totally cancel, sell your spot, get healthy and get ready to roll. Find ways to get in some of more swims or... I mean, do 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 some visualization. Again, like I said, find open water opportunities. You get in the pool, swim harder again with your wetsuit. It sounds like it's all mental. So there is no reason to say, again, if, if Florida is your biggest goal, then why are you even even 
considering doing this half. Mm. Obviously, her follow up is like, you know, I should add I'm getting physio treatment shockwave, so I may be better in a few weeks. Time to get training in. Not sure yet, of course. Yeah, nobody's fucking sure. Nobody has any idea how we're going to feel tomorrow. But the best thing you can do is to just make the best decision in the interim that you possibly can. And that means making the end goal the priority and being positive. So no, doing a a half Ironman just to feel confident is a bad idea, especially if you're not going to be healthy to do it because all you're doing is opening a door to not feel healthy to going in. Especially it's not like you're, it's not like it's a foot issue, right? It's an upper body issue. So the one, the, the, the one sport that is heavy upper body is the swim. So it makes zero sense to do that. So that is my suggestion. There's a lot of things you can do to mental for mental competence. Um, and, and another thing is like about mental confidence, like be honest about it. You know, what do I need to do to be confident with it? Cause you know, again, you on, on, on both ends of it, um, you know, swim is your weakness, but you know, you also said, but I do train a lot for my swim so I can do it and feel confident physically. Okay. We're there. Right. So, so again, I, I don't see a win coming out of that. Um, if anything, it might set you back. So no, I, I would recommend not doing again. Who knows? You know, you could feel like a million bucks a week before and then play it by ear. Like, you know, that's how things should go in a lot of ways is, is, you know, play it by ear, do the best you can. And then, you know, but triathletes are planning gets in the way is, is like oftentimes a detriment of success for most athletes. They try to, they, they over plan, add an extra plan to their plan and then a to-do list to their plan of the plan. And then a to-do list of that to-do list of the plan of the plan. And then when one thing doesn't go perfectly, they're like, Ugh. I don't know how I'm going to adjust when you're like, that's life. Right. So the more you plan, the more opportunities there are for things to intervene, for negative things to come in, for inconveniences to arise. And all that does, especially for type A triathletes, right, who like to be in control of everything, which you wouldn't have any idea that was actually the fact if you read Facebook groups when no one's even read the athlete guide, is just take it day by day. Do the best you can. You got the finish you got. Effort, execution, day over. Cross the finish line, reassess, be happy you finished, and move on. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of that is right up my alley. I think she mentioned tendonitis in that one. Um, minus parentheses, mouse shoulder is what I read. <laughs> I have been, I have had, I've had a cron. I mean, it's, it's always there kind of nagging at me and reminding me. And I know, and I've also had a wrist issue this whole time <clears throat> this year. I've, my wrist has been sore since all summer or whatever. So like the next two weeks I have a, you know, cause what happens is, <clears throat> biking and uh, even running and certainly swimming kind of irritate it. So I've been dealing with it. So this is part of my tapers. I'm just trying to heal that up as much as possible. I don't always do that. You know, I, it feels good. And then I go out and like hammer it and then it starts bothering me again or whatever. So I'm going to be wearing that wrist brace more often, just trying to heal that up or whatever. But I go through that, you know, I don't know if there's a way that, you know, you can't swim normally if you can breaststroke or I don't know, but like, I always look for things like that that you can do. And like you said, um, last year at the race, I, I got in, it was a couple of days before I think. And cause I decided the day before I wasn't going to risk it. <laughs> I was like, I don't get my head around this. Cause the wetsuit thing always does that, you know, chest pain or pressure on you. And I kind of just had a weird, I started out too hot in the practice swim and got a little bit, you know, overheated and anxious and it was sucked. And it's all day Saturday. I just thought about it. And then I went out Sunday and I had a good, swim but same thing happened to me yesterday but at least i have a few weeks i'm going to just keep you know getting in it and getting through it and getting used to it and get that confidence level up at least knowing that you know i have been swimming a lot but not with the wetsuit and i was like damn you know i felt pretty good most of the summer swimming and now this throws in there so um yeah it's just for me it's just about okay i got two weeks to get my head straight on this and get my body straight and uh that's all you can do, you know. Um, race day has a weird way of kind of bringing out more energy for me. And, um, you know, if, if there's a limit on how much you can train, I suppose, anyway. So, you know, I don't know. I, I Using overtraining as confidence has never really necessarily worked for me. Right. Get it right, get it tight. 
Mm-hmm. Next question is Jody Sanders. Uh, tips for leveraging bike workouts to support marathon training. I feel like it's like a bit of a superpower. We can have an advantage over regular marathoners by weaving in a really strong bike or two in place of a run or two each week. Answered. We took care of that one on last Thursday for sure. Yeah. Um, so back <laughs> That's deja vu, man. I, right? It's like, you know, go back in. We, yeah, we did. We covered that one. Dan McCarty. Thoughts on double hard days and easy days. As in, as in, say, hard bike and run or swim on the same day, followed by one or two easy, not full rest days versus one hard, one easy session each day without total recovery days for those of us who are able and want to train two a day. Thanks, guys. Yeah, that's a it's a great question. Um, and, and it's becoming, you know, I think hard, again, is a relative term, um, and so is easy. You know, a lot of people don't go you know, as hard as they probably should on hard days because they're under recovered because they go too hard on their easy days. But it's become is becoming very popular um to do what you know you'll see if you read back like in the last you know, one, two, like maybe two and a half years from the uh middle distance and short uh Norwegian runners is they have this thing called double threshold days where and this has been mostly explored in running. Obviously, you could do it. I've explored some of it in track training uh, with some athletes and even myself on occasion. So what they mean by is, you know, in the morning, you do a threshold session. Again, threshold meaning a very, very monitored and regulated threshold. So, again, most people are probably thinking they're doing threshold and they're probably going way too hard. So let's say in the morning you'll do a threshold session. Let's say, again, this has mostly been in running. So an example would be in the morning they do a threshold session of, you know, maybe 10 by 1Ks on the track at threshold at, you know, X recovery. And then later on in the evening they double up and they do a same length or even shorter session again at threshold but the intervals are shorter so maybe instead of doing a, a full k they do a half k or even shorter and then the and then again the threshold aka their threshold is heavily monitored with a variety of di- uh, devices whether it's heart rate whether it's they run with power whether it's measuring lactate to figure out just how just exactly what their threshold is and the science behind that is that you know you're already going to need you know, recovery the next day from your one session. So get it by doing two in a day, you can kind of get a get really, really good bang for your buck. Um, and I, I've tried this in the past. I've had athletes do it. Yeah, you know, I still have some athletes do it in certain periods. It does take a very strong and a very durable athlete to do this and a very intelligent athlete because knowing what your threshold is is the most important piece, right? It's like, a lot of bathers probably go in and do like two very, very high intensity workouts, you know? And so you have two questions, right? Do I dinner do a bike and a run? And then in what order do I do it in? Do I do my bike threshold in the morning? Then I do a run in the evening. If I do my run in the evening, my thre- my legs are going to be pretty fatigued. So I already know my run form is going to be compromised. Again, for most triathletes, it probably would, unless you're a really, really strong runner. So now I'm running threshold intervals, with compromised form in the evening and tired legs on the run. So how much am I really going to get out of it? Or do I do my threshold run in the morning and then really, really take a pounding to my legs? And then how am I even going to be able to hit threshold on the bike in the evening? You know, so there's a lot of ways to go about, yes, do I see a benefit of it? 100%. Um, I mean, I know a lot of athletes that that I work with and that have done in the past is like you do like an easy day and, and a, a double intensity day and then a, and then an aerobic day and just kind of like cycle through that. Or you might go longer. You might go easy, sw- easy day, swim or bike, all intensity day, all aerobic day, recovery day, and then take like maybe even a day off, start over. You know, so this, yes, I think it's 100% beneficial um, because what I've also found is you know, let's say you, you let's say you're only going to do four intense sessions in a week, and you're doing your own training plan, and or you have someone doing it for you, and you have four intense training sessions. Well, more than likely, they're all going to be spread out, right? Unless it's a, unless they're adding in a swim, right? Swim on a bike day, swim, swim on a run day. You're looking at at least half the week where you really got to kind of go to the well. 
right? Mm-hmm. That even looking at it, that can take something out of you. But so let's say like, I'll give you an example of a week I've designed for myself in the past is Monday, super chill, easy swim, day off or easy bike. Tuesday, double threshold day. So I would do bike long intervals in the morning, like four by eight, four by 10, four by 12. So threshold has to be a little bit lower. So I'm not crushing myself because the intervals are so long. And then in the evening, I actually would hop on the treadmill and do like maybe four by two on incline. Easier on the legs. Again, not on the track. So I'm not pounding. Heels are already easier in your skeletal system. And then the intervals are shorter. And then Wednesday is an aerobic day. Easy. Thursday is an easy day, recovery day. Easy. Friday, again, double threshold day. Very similar, but I might do, you know, uh, shorter bike intervals and longer run intervals. Saturday, long ride. Easy. Sunday, long run. Easy. So if you look back at the week out of the seven days, I've only have two hard days. The rest are pretty easy to wrap my brain around. They're either aerobic or recovery or off. And so I, th- I do. I think there's a lot of both physiological benefits to that and in, in leveraging that kind of a format. And then I also think there's a lot of psychological benefits. And instead of seeing like, you know, a hard swim on Monday, a hard bike on Tuesday, a hard run on Wednesday, maybe nothing, you know, too hard on Thursday and then a hard, you know, run on Friday. You're like, well, fuck, <laughs> My week's full of hard, you know, mm. so it is. I think there's, a, but you have to be very, very intelligent about how you approach it, um, especially if you're coaching yourself. And and then again, making sure that you're actually doing them at threshold and not way over because um, then you're, you're not defeating the purpose, but you're going to be a lot more fatigued. And then again, you're not, you're not utilizing and using the energy system that you're really intending to use. Yeah, I, I, I like the sound of that, and I, I think I do that a lot just sort of by accident. You know, we've talked about how Cody Beals wakes up and decides what he's going to do on that day a lot of times, and, and I think that's where I come in is, is I don't know, with, with life and aging and all these types of things, you know, and you talked about how Blumenfeld and those guys are dialing things in and they have to be really, you know, on top of what's going on and all that. I just don't think that's realistic for most people. So when I feel it, I kind of feel it and I'll, and I'll take advantage of it. Um, sometimes I could just be pop like, like on that ride Saturday, I, I hadn't really done a t- lot of tough stuff this week, but on that ride Saturday, I got, I felt kind of terrible for the first few hours. And then that last hour, I kind of started feeling a little bit. So I just put some things in there and took advantage of how I was feeling and, uh, rode a little harder. So I don't know. I mean, I, there's like, uh, this, you know, exact sciences hasn't always been easy for me. So, um, you know, a lot of people that week you described sounds, sounds beautiful. And then some days I would wake up on, you know, and feel great the next day or whatever, after two couple of hard days, if I was feeling good, I don't know. It's just a cycle of uh, body clock or something with me that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I just, I really like to take, if I'm out on a run and it's an easy run and I'm feeling good, I just maybe, I've always been a big fan of, um, you know, just simple things like strides, you know, because uh, yeah. for me, that's um, as much as, you know, that's the thing I've been trying to think about a lot while, while running this year is is um, actually running, you know, keeping reminding myself of what running form is instead of getting trapped in a long slogger all the time. Mm. Because I, I feel like that's what happens a lot. And I feel like that happens on the bike too. And I, I've really been trying to pay attention to that because Madison's such a punchy course. And I think last year, I know it was a really rainy and cold day and everything like that. But I think that mentally that put me in, uh, back on my seat, you right. know? And I, I just, cause it's like, just get through it, just get through it. Instead of, you know, we, I watched the, uh, last year's Wisconsin Ironman recording and, uh, was it Brent McNabb? Was that the guy who won it? Brent McMahon, McMahon. won it last year. Yep. I mean, that dude was just, he <laughs> You know, he rode four four whatever. <laughs> it was like he did that race in eight thirty, and the guy was racing. You know, but some other people couldn't handle it for whatever reason. And I, I just, I, I think yeah, there's a get pots out there in like a speedo and a tank top. Yeah, I mean, it's a fine line, right, between you know me and I know the it's better to be safe than sorry for sure. 
You know, I, I felt like I've said this before a couple of times when I've raced, uh, I've been like, yeah, I just felt a little clunky out there, you know, <laughs> sort of like put you back in your saddle and kind of just, uh, in a lot of ways kind of makes it harder. It's sort of picking your poison a little bit. You know, it's a real fine line. I've talked about what I wore and everything last time and I was definitely warm, which is great. I got it done, which is great. And, but if you're looking for answers, you're like, all right, could, you know, maybe I didn't need this or whatever, you know, would I... You know, one of the things I noticed about how he was riding, too, <clears throat> was, man, from the get-go, he was out of his saddle <laughs> all the time. And I think it was partially because it was cold, right? And he's trying to warm up and get into the flow rather than, you know, settle into the, you know, almost frozen category. I don't know. I just find that stuff interesting. Yeah, listen, there's a lot to be said for waking up and seeing how you feel and getting after it. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you, if you got it, go for it. But just know, just like you, and that's that's the hardest thing for athletes, right? It's like if you, what was it last Tuesday? I mean, last Tuesday I got on the bike to do like an hour of intervals, and I just had it. Mm-hmm. Just had it. Legs had it. So I extended it two hours, and I went hard. But what I also knew is that meant the next day I was going to have to take it very easy. So, you, again, you if you're going to take the liberty – and have the confidence to adjust and go hard on the days where you just got it right. And really utilize having heart rates lower than normal powers, higher than normal paces, faster than normal, whatever it is. We all know when we got it. And then you also have to have that, the take the Liberty and the confidence to know that the next day needs to be changed and needs to go easy. Keep it aerobic, right? Cause that what happens that allows you to wake up having more days where you're feeling it. Right. By listening, you know, and that's that's the thing, right? Is that your, your head and your heart are in one bucket and your ego is in the other. And the ego for most people and the ego slash lack of confidence, right? Because most, most athletes are driven. I'd say more athletes are driven by lack of confidence or fear of hurting their ego than in their actual ego. Um, because they're, they're always worried they're not doing too much. Or... You know, an athlete, like, again, example, I had an athlete that I've just recently started working with again after a year or two that she took off and she's doing a marathon and she ran for an hour and a half, which is my scheduled run for her on Saturday. And she was like, I just feel like I, you know, I should be, I should be doing longer runs, you know, with the marathon I've got coming up in a couple months and my friend did a 14 miler, you know, should I be doing that? And I just said, listen, from where you were when we started together, you were on the, the perfect trajectory of progression in terms of taking you from where you were last week to where we are this week so we can get to where I want to go next week. If you were out, if you go, were going to go out right now and do a 14 mile run, it would take you three hours. Does that sound like a smart idea? No, it sounds, it sounds stupid, right? But when you, but when you get caught up in the moment and you look at what else somebody else is doing, then your lack of confidence gets in the way of just, Typical street smarts and common sense. Next question. Cody Meyer, what kind of generic advice would you give someone to structure their training to try and just maintain fitness and race completion capability when life takes over and training has to take a back seat? Is a 10 hour training week really enough? I'm starting my PhD soon, moving states, new job, but also want to continue training for mental health. <sighs> yeah, dude, 10 hours a week is plenty to pretty much do whatever you want. Obviously, you know, will you max out your performance ability and athlete, full athletic ability? No, but you're also doing exactly what you said. New job, new state, PhD, starting your PhD. That's a shit ton of life going on right there. So adjusting accordingly is really the best thing. And the, the, the way I would always start to approach that is limit the losses. And what I mean by that is time, right? Cause time right now is your limiting factor. Starting your PhD, a new job again is always stressful. Whether it's a good job that you want or not, whether moving states is a good thing or not. You know, you and I have both, you know, moved in the last year, like moving is hard. It's stressful. So all these things while good stress is stress. So I would even, you know, not even start at a 10 hour week. I'd started like a four or five hour week. Oh, well, what if I, what if I might lose fitness? What you need to do is gain confidence and stay healthy. So, you know, sprinkle in two to three runs a week, one ride, one swim, 
options for choice days and days off if you've done the rest. That's it. Keep it very, very simple. And then once you do that for a week or two, get in a groove. Maybe add a little bit more. Take away a choice day, right? Or maybe you like the choice day. Add in a run. So doing what you feel instead of feeling like you're constrained by, you know, a a predetermined plan. Again, going back to the previous question, waking up and just doing what you feel like doing is huge. I just kind of feel like swimming today. Then go swim. Yeah. Oh, but swim the schedule. So go swim, right? Especially if your life is like that. So, yeah, I mean, while we can't structure their training, you know, or, you know, find, you know, if running is your weakness, then don't even get on the bike or the, or go soar, go swim. Those are the two most time consuming. Just run three or four days a week, four to five days a week. Takes less time. You can do it from your house. Easy enough. Least equipment, less time. Easier on, you know, easy stress in terms of, you know, getting it done and not having to worry about fitting it in. And that's one of those things that doesn't, you know, running doesn't take preparation like cycling does, right? Got to get, you know, if you're going outside, you know, whole different deal. If you're getting on the trainer, whole different deal. You know, go ahead, got to drive to the pool. You got into the water. You got to find a lane where the swim times. Running is just like, all right, shoes on, door gone. That's it. Bye. See you later. So I would do something like that. I mean, I think it's a pretty, um, again, like setting the bar really, really low is honestly the best way you can like find your way to being successful in, in, in that specific circumstance. Yeah, I can't even argue with that, man. I think, uh, as we said yeah. many times, yeah. they argue with me anyway. <laughs> um, exercise is supposed to give you energy, not take it away, and I think that's a perfect <clears throat> situation for that. Movement is medicine. Mm -hmm. Next question, Laura Min: Strategies for a very slow runner completing a half. I'm. I'm so slow. 75 year old walkers pass me when I'm running run is a strong word for what I do. I can't afford to slow down on the run, but also don't want to burn myself out on the swim of the bike. You know, this is a great question. And Laura, we know you've been to some of our camps before swim camps and tri camps and you were, you're being a little bit too harsh on yourself. If I, if I, <clears throat> yeah, a bit, if I do say so wonderful person. Um, you know, I, I work with a few athletes that, in, in all different levels, right? And understanding the athlete you are is is probably one of the biggest areas of of gain you can have, right? So regardless of what you consider speedy or fast, knowing what you are is in, is is imperative to getting the most out of yourself. Who cares about somebody else? Yourself, like example. I was working with a a lady in was less as last May, right? Still work with her, but we had only been together for a few months. And I knew at that point she was doing a 70.3, but her main goal was a full. So I knew that while her, her run was there, it was more strong than it was fast. But what I knew she had was a much improved swim and a strong and fast bike. So what I told her was, is listen, I, I think we've got a strong run. Or excuse me, I think we have a strong run, but not a fast run. So no matter how much you bury yourself on the bike, you're probably not going to lose that much time on the run. Because you're strong. You might lose a minute, but you're not going to lose 10 because you're not losing speed. You've got the strength to hold it. And I, I think that that really falls in the same category of what you're talking about. I know you have seen you swim. I've seen you ride. You're good at both. You're a really good swimmer. I would absolutely blow the doors off the swim and then absolutely destroy the bike. Because if you feel like you that the running is your weakness, then again, um, I guess the best example I could give is when we talk about swimming. You know, when swimmers really, really get into the sport, you tell them to go easy and you tell them to go hard. And there's like, and I don't know, three second difference per hundred. <laughs> you know, there's like, I'm swimming 220s, going easy. I'm swimming 217s. I'm going fast. There really isn't that much wiggle room to like really, really, really get a lot out of yourself. You know what I mean? That's the same thing. So you're not, you know, where that say to swim easier and fast, you're going to get the same time. No matter what. But swimming easier, swimming fast, you're going to lose, you're going to get the same time, right? 
same thing with the run. If, if this is the approach you have, and I think a lot of athletes have this, especially they're coming off injury or they just feel like the running is their, their weak spot. Absolutely go out and blow the doors off. Man, that's going to be my, my, um, my advice to an athlete that's in Wisconsin 70.3. She came to me a year and a half ago. Her doctor said, you can never run again. You can definitely never run back-to-back days. You'll never do this. Well, we just ran three days in a row, and she's in incredible shape. Her Is her run fast? It's getting there. It's faster. But is it speedy? No. But has her swim gotten better? Yes. Is her bike really, really good? Yes. So as a coach, you think, all right, do we bike conservative so we can maybe gain a whole minute on the run? Or do we destroy the bike, gain six minutes, and then lose two minutes on the run? Well, I gained four. Mm-hmm. That's a that's that that's a lot of time. Whether you want to, you know, whether it's a sprint, Olympic, it's, I mean, <clears> anything, <throat> four minutes is a while. So you again know what you are, but again, you know, and be able to attack it. Same goes for if running is your strength. Right, it's your it's it is your strength. It's you. It's where you are the fastest, and that's where you take a little bit easier, maybe on the bike, and don't be as as aggressive because what you have the ability to gain on the run is so much more significant than what you can gain. What what you might gain on the bike, right? I might gain one or two minutes on the on the bike, but then I might, you know, only gain four to five minutes on the run. Yeah, you gain seven minutes. So what if I bike smart and then I can go gain. 12 or 13 on the run. Now I'm at a plus nine. And that, those are all things you have to think about. And again, I think practicing that in sprints and Olympics and short course races is a, is a huge, of a huge benefit. So that's what, um, that's the way I would have approached it. I'm sure there'd be maybe a lot of different opinions on that, but that is what I would do is, 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 you know, <laughs> don't, don't submerge your strengths and fear of your weakness, maximize your strength and limit your weakness. Mm. Boy, that's a really interesting question, I think. I mean, and the how, the way you talked about it, you know, because we always, you know, we're always talking about don't burn your biscuits on the bike. And I think there's obviously a lot to be said for that. But there is some certain situations when, and honestly, I think I'm kind of that guy in a, in a way. You know, I, I've tried going out and being a little more cautious on the bike and and my run doesn't seem to be any different, really. You know, I've... Uh, I've been thinking about that as far as Wisconsin goes. Is I think I've been um, maybe holding back a little bit in my, what, you know, we talked about maybe my run's my strength, but I think my run might be my strength in a strong way, mm. in a tenacity way. Um, but I think my bike is my most skilled position. And I need to, t- I've been thinking about, it, I need to take more advantage of that this year. At least I, I, mentally, that's where I'm at. So Um, yeah, like you're saying, you know, can I go out and save 15, 20 minutes on that bike and then, you know, maybe not lose as much on the run or whatever. And I do think that's a, I mean, also, I think there's a, something to be said for, um, you know, going easy on the bike. It's just such a weird thing for me. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if, if, if a lot of people actually have a handle on what that means, because I mean, normally at, at the end of 112 miles, I'm, it doesn't feel good. You know, I mean, it's a hard deal to go out there and ride that thing. Um, even in a, like a zone two zone, upper zone two or whatever, a, a controlled, but strong way is different than just kind of like pedaling for, you know, seven hours or whatever. So there's just like, like a fine line in there all the time about I think we may have a little bit more in us sometimes I mean you know it's always different with 70.3s and you know I think a lot more people are actually just ripping 70.3s like almost in Olympic fashion these days and and finding out that they can get off and run pretty well so um I don't know I I, it's it's I like what you said there because I think that's a perfect example of uh what she should do is go out and get out in front of it and then just hold on. And and that's, I think I mentioned that last time. It's like, even on the run for me, sometimes if I feel good that first half of the marathon, I'm almost better kind of holding on by building a little bit of padding rather than trying to pace it out in such a way that I can finish stronger than I started. It's, It's just difficult to do, you know? 
um, because your run form just, I mean, a lot of people on that marathon, their run form just starts going to hell and it just becomes a battle of, of toughness. And am I there mentally? I don't know. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. Cause as I was, I don't know why, I think when I was emailing this or texting some of this yesterday, actually you came to mind. Thank you. And I was like, I, want, I was like, I wonder if this should be his strategy you know, is to, is to go out, you know, swim like you can swim but be a lot more aggressive than normal on the bike, you know, cause you know, especially in long courses. And again, like, you know, this, you know, we're not about brand all your biscuits. It's about knowing yourself and pacing. Right. And, and also depending on what your training was like, you know, but I, th- I think a lot of us, especially in the Ironman distance, you know, you, cause you know, there's one thing if it's your plan and it's another thing if it's your, we, it's your inability to plan, right, and stick to it, right? Because that's what you see most people do is, you know, we always say there's no such thing as a good bike followed by a bad run, you know. And, you know, the course is always littered with 40 to 60-year-old men walking and talking about how great their bike split was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and that's what they're walking. You know, but if it's your plan because you know your, you know, you know your weaknesses or you know you didn't run enough or you've been injured, then that is your plan. Right. And then on the flip side, you know, there's, there's kind of two mental approaches to it. And like you said, immensely strong enough is like, if I am, if I am chasing the clock and it's always us against the clock, am I in a place where I want to be chasing a time to get time back and be on the offensive? Perhaps maybe taking your bike a little bit easier than you usually do. And then, and then running, you know, as fast as you can to catch time or am I in a spot to where I think, I'd much rather fend off time. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, yeah, and that's, that's kind awesome. of what I heard you say. It's like, you know, it, 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 am I in the spot to chase time? Me, maybe not. Am I in a spot to where I feel like I can get off the bike and be like, all right, listen, all I got to do is fend off six minutes. Let's see how this plays out. Instead of gain six minutes. That's a, that's a really different place to be in. And again, it's about knowing and being honest and objective about the training that you did, how much of it you did and how ready you are. And then what aspect are you ready? Cause a lot of people would probably be better off fending off that six minutes and <laughs> depending on how, depending on how it went. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's an interesting, I think it's an interesting approach. Right. And you, and you go back to like the, you know, not the last year or two, but previously, you know, you had our you know, athletes like Andrew Starkowitz and, and the, the Uber bikers back in the day and everybody's so well-rounded. And it was just like, I know I can't, I know I'm never going to chase anybody down in the run. Never. But can I get a big enough lead in the bike to where I don't give up first? I might never run to first, but I wonder how long I can hold off coming in second and i think that's you know as for an athlete i think that's a question you ask yourself um and again that's why it's always it's i think it's hard if you're self-coached to understand and kind of see your own blind spots because we all have them uh and and, but i I do think it's a um it's a question you should all ask yourself whether you're you know overtrained injured undertrained strengths weaknesses how do i go you know how do i approach it um, but again, that's why racing is, is so experiential and so experimental in that it's always good to practice that kind of stuff too. And you can do it in training, but you just can't do it often if you can't race a lot. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting, interesting kind of self, self dialogue. I think we all have before we race. Definitely is, man. All right. One last question. Uh, let me pick one. Not doing that one. Not doing that one. Uh, come on, give me something. Uh, uh, right, here's a good one we get all the time. Differences between running outside versus on a treadmill. Difference in doing long runs outside versus treadmill. Interval sessions outdoor or inside. Does one have a higher injury risk? How to make the treadmill close to outside as possible. Thanks again, you guys. You've helped me so much in training and life and happiness. See you in Wisconsin. We will see you in Wisconsin, Josh Cunningham. Um, that's a great question. And one you got you get a lot in obviously like the winter, um, you know, the, the winter hours and in the winter time, but then also like the last like two weeks. Um, is and I give advice like if it's way too hot or way too cold and you're doing intervals, do them inside. 
just do them inside. Do them on the treadmill. Uh, general best practices for treadmill is depending on the treadmill is 0.5 or 1.0 on the incline. That is the best, the best way to replicate actual true run form and economy outside. The more you do that, the more off your regular stride you get. And you're probably thinking, oh, well, that's better. I'll be stronger. Well, it's not your normal run stride. So you're not working what you really want to work. Right. That's why I like big gear great is big gear work is great as a complement to your regular training, but not for every single one. And so, you know, 0.5 to 1 percent, uh, you know, does one have higher injury risk or not? That's a tough question for me. Um, you know, I've had I've seen athletes and had us get hurt running outside and get run on the treadmill. The most common issue I see in the on the treadmill is tight IT bands and Achilles issues, because when you are running on a surface that might may look stable, the belt is never totally stable and will always shift, and that can that tends to put a lot of pressure on your Achilles. Um, you also will never have your actual true run form on a treadmill because you know and your body knows and your mind knows whether you whether you're thinking about it subconsciously or not, or consciously, excuse me is you are confined to a very small rectangle of space to where you run too fast and you run up on the you run up on the 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 dashboard. You run too slow, you fall off the back. You run too far to the left, you run off the side. Same thing on the right. So you you never truly have like an actual good stride, especially if you are running easy. Now if you're running fast and you can really open it up, that's when you kind of generally have your best your best stride. You know, but the, alternating was fine. I mean, there's a lot of athletes who do, you know, a lot of treadmill running. I mean, I know there's been people, there's been guys that have won 50 mile, 100 mile races doing all their running on a treadmill. Mm. So it's not like it's, you know, this, you need the impact to crush. Yes, is it beneficial? Sure, but you only got to do it one time. You know, and if, and if, and, you know, having said that, if you're only able to run 20 miles outside because it's hard too hard on your body, but you could run 30 miles inside, which one's better? 30 miles inside. So there, there's a lot to take in to, to take into that. You know, speed work I think is great on the treadmill. Uh, and don't like if you got like you know you're doing like three minutes on, 30 seconds off. Don't even slow the treadmill down. No, oh, but how will they accurately apply the correct mileage uh, to it? No, just stand on the rails. <laughs> take a 30 second breather and then go back and do it again. Because I, I do find that the treadmill hurt, uh, excuse me, helps with high turnover. Um, for most people like on the, I'm, I'll never forget. I was, this is man, five years ago, six years ago, whenever they had Chattanooga as the Ironman world championships for 70.3 distance, I went up there, Allie and Hayden, I went up there to cheer on some of our athletes when we were living in Nashville. So yeah, six, seven years ago, and I went to the, we we're sitting on the Marriott. I went down to get a workout in, and there was Tim Don. At the time, Tim Don was like one of the best 70.3 athletes in the world. And he was in there, headphones in on the treadmill. And I got on my workout, and he was getting off. And I said, Hey, you know, good luck. And I said, You know, and it's, I kind of asked him, I said, You know, why are you on the treadmill and not outside? He goes, He goes, it's, it's a little bit easier on the body, but I feel like I get a little more snap in my legs with a higher turnover on the treadmill. I was like, All right, I've said. Um, and I think it allows you to kind of focus and visualize a little bit more than being outside, depending on where you're running, sidewalks, traffic, lights, people, cars, you know, everything in between. So I, I, I definitely, just like anything, I think it's a great complement to what you can do and what you should do with training. Um, but just like everything else, like don't, I wouldn't recommend using it all the time because that what you do see what, in my experience, what I have seen happen is like, you know, you do lose that east-west athletic ability to maneuver, right? So you need that. So being outside, you know, so having some kind of, a, you know, the the ability to perform agility is a good thing for an all athletes. And that is very limited. Just like we don't say ride your trainer inside all the time. Does it have its benefits? 100%. A lot of benefits training inside. Can it be of a detriment? Yes. Uh, it can be. Uh, just like treadmill outside the time same thing with always riding outside all the time you know you might not be able to go as hard because you're so worried about the thing so just like anything there are positives there are negatives there are drawbacks use it wisely and use it at 0.5 to 1 percent 
uh, and be smart with it. But yeah, that's um, but Lee, that's all I have for today. All right, yeah, the uh, I I got into some grooves where I really like the treadmill, and I think the main thing for me too is what you just said is the uh, what Don said is the pop. It's sort of, sort of a forced cadence. And I like that. I mean, because some, some, that's why the same reason I like those strides is it just kind of reminds me that I have to be running, not just, you know, going along with the scenery. And I don't know. Sometimes I get real lazy running. And I think that's kind of a good way to remind yourself to keep it popping. Yeah. And I think, you know, to, to you know, don't force yourself to always do any. Mm-hmm. You know, like in the in the, you know, when it's hot outside, don't make yourself always run outside when it's hot because you won't get as much out of it. And then you'll eventually hate running outside that you won't want to run, period. Same thing when it's, you know, bitter cold in, in the wintertime. Don't always go outside and run because you're eventually going to dread it because it's so fucking cold. And you're not going to want to run, period. Same thing on the trainer. I don't want to go out back on the trainer again. Go outside in your mountain bike or gravel bike, you know, fat tire bike, whatever it is in the winter. Keep things fresh and keep things flexible and keep things fun because if you do that, then you'll keep doing them. But anytime you're very staunchly opposed or for doing anything, at some point you're going to crack. So anything you can do, treadmill, you know, you got treadmill, you got the trails, you got gravel, you got the track, you got, you know, pavement, sidewalks, greenway. Same thing with the bike. You got mountain bikes, you got fat tire you got gravel you got trainer you got road bike you got cruising with your friends you got doing tts you got all these things all these things so keep it fresh and that is the best way to get fitness um because again the um you know what's the quote the the best ability is availability and a lot of times people associate that with being injured but the the reality of the situation is it's more so about being engaged and wanting to still do what you're doing and being consistent with it. So be consistent with it. We will hope you enjoyed today. We'll see you on Thursday. As always, we love you. We appreciate you. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of your questions, but that's just how the cookie crumbles some days. Uh, so be flexible with it just like we were. We'll see you on Thursday. As always, go to our website, c26triathlon.com and is our one-stop shop for all things coaching camps and community if you need anything from the man the myth the legend mike Turali, the ambassador for the inner train he is available at crushing iron at gmail.com if you need anything from me specifically c26 coach at gmail.com all right man back to the couch for me <laughs> <laughs> all right let's see you. see you